Welcome back, my friends. This is Runehammer, and you are on the RPG mainframe. This is episode 41. Welcome back. Good to have you guys. Thank you, patrons, and welcome new patrons. This is the Runehammer podcast. Oh, my goodness gracious. This is going to be a special episode, a little different than the usual. It's been recently brought to my attention that a lot of you out there are living that life, that real life. The life of TVs, cars, cell phones, weird weather, jobs, coming and going, hustle and bustle. And amidst all this, the RPG and the RPG mainframe, the hobby itself, give you a bastion, safe place, a refuge of creativity and of joy. To weather the storm of everyday life. And this episode, episode 41 right here, is going to be a tribute and a tool to that refuge. And I'm just like you guys. I have a bunch of stuff going on too. <laughs> and my favorite place to be is in my creative sanctum. Now that could be playing with friends, that could be fiending over my journal, that could be wringing my hands over what new horrors I'm going to unleash reading my latest book, or cutting out and folding miniatures, painting, whatever. But there's a refuge in applying our minds to details and to imagination and to creativity and to play, to having fun, to dreaming up stories for the sake of it. So for episode 41, I propose to you three meditations mental exercises, journeys of the brain that will hopefully make you more creative, more safe, a brief reprieve from this life that never ends until it ends with a capital E. But until then, we will live vibrant, creative, loving lives. And episode 41 is my special sort of message to all of you, to remember the core of what we do, which is your creativity, your mind state, your ability to access and enjoy the creative side of your brain. Here are three exercises to enhance that ability and to give you a refuge. Maybe you're riding on the subway this morning. Maybe you're commuting to work. Maybe you're out on a, on a jog or walking to your next appointment. Nevertheless, I present to you the three exercises here on the RPG mainframe.
much further, Master. These mountains, they're endless. Just up here, my boy. The temple is this high to make it inaccessible to plunderers and barbarians. We'll be there soon. There, just above that next ridge. Come. Master, it looks deserted, ancient. Are you sure this is the right place? To find a mental peace, to open my mind to the final levels of my training. A fine question, my boy. As quiz inquisitive as ever. <laughs> this will be my final journey. To bring you here. And the mental techniques that you will learn will usher you into the final chamber of wizardry. Set aside your old self, my boy, and go into those great, tall doorways there, and never look back. Welcome to the Inner Sanctum. The first step in taking command of your mind, taking command of your power, becoming the wizard that you always dreamed of being, becoming the thinker, the creative, the visionary. To accomplish these things, or at least to begin, you will need access to your full mental capacity so that all your circuitry, all your processing power, all your thinking power is available to you now. One of the greatest errors that the new thinker makes is to use their mind power on things they cannot control or change, namely the past and the future. When we stop using our mind on these things and use our mind on the present, we become infinitely more capable, more creative, more loving, more considerate. We become listeners rather than talkers. And the might of the mind when fully applied to the task currently at hand is difficult to overstate. Now described in this fashion, the concept of being mindful, as it is known, sounds almost impossible. Our fascination with the past and our dread of the future or our ambition for the future or our changing of the past can be all-consuming. But do not look to the great grown oak when you only have an acorn in your hand. There is a way to begin to find mindfulness. And it is the simplest of all paths, the simplest exercise to accessing the full processing power of your mind. There are three methods within this, the first exercise, and we will do them now, together. But you will continue to exercise these three methods, this first exercise for as long as you remain interested in becoming a more creative thinker. The first method is to call out things you see. Now, this may sound foolish at first, but life's blur often is sliding past us and we fail to even notice or note what we are experiencing. This simple exercise is a matter of naming things that you see or hear. Tree, brook, bird, sky, door, 
woman, dog, fence, tree, tree, sign, man, sidewalk, and so forth. You will become very quickly bored with this technique. Now, this boredom is not a sign that you have not mastered it. It is a natural behavior of the mind to tempt you to use your processing power on things that are not currently occurring. Now the same can apply to vastly more complex things you are currently experiencing. They need not be as simple as a tree, or a sidewalk, or a sign, or a man. They can be as complex as a book, a task, a concept, a friend, forgiveness, redemption loyalty. The trick of naming things you see does not lie in the simplicity, and it does not lie in the speed or, in fact, even the accuracy. The trick to this method, the utility of this method, is that boredom. If you are practicing the method properly, you will become quickly bored. This is a sign that you are beginning to access the full power of your mind to do something which is relatively simple, to name the things you are experiencing. But remember, the methods, and indeed even the exercises themselves, are not the goal. The goal is to become mindful. That is the first exercise. And the first method within mindfulness is the ability to name things that you are seeing. Take time now to practice the first method of the first exercise. Name the things you see as you see them, unfiltered, with no purpose and no outcome. Do this for a short time. Excellent. Your patience is admirable, and I'm sure you already begin to see how little you conventionally do this with your mind power, how little of the mind we often use to address what we are actually doing and experiencing. The next method within the first exercise, the road to mindfulness, is much like the first, but rather than objects, it applies to actions. Actions can be far more complex, even when we are performing them ourselves, because our motivations and our methods, even our intention span, can blur exactly what we are doing at any moment. The second method in the road to mindfulness is to announce to yourself what you are doing. Now, this also may seem uselessly reductive when it comes to our perception of daily life, but in fact, it is a supreme exercise in mindfulness. I am sitting by the river. I am lying on a stone. I am talking to my beloved. I am arguing. I am becoming angry. I'm eating a sandwich. I'm walking down the street. I'm saying hello to whoever I choose. I'm looking at the sky. I'm putting on my shoes. The exercise of announcing to yourself what you are doing not only brings your mind into the present moment, which, remember, is our goal, to use your entire mind for the present. And it does this, at least in a minute fashion 
but it has a secondary purpose, which is that it creates a singular action that you are performing. Oftentimes, we will be tying our shoes, but while we are tying our shoes, we are also wondering if we'll be on time. We are also worrying about the bill that remains unpaid. We are also hoping for the master's approval. Hoping for the master's approval is a thing you can announce to yourself. But if you announce this, it is like saying, I am only hoping for the master's approval. I am spending a moment right now hoping for the master's approval. Now that example seems far more nuanced, more interesting, more worthy of our thinking power. But it is no less important and requires no less mindfulness to do with purity as tying one's shoes. It has been said that the nobility of a thing is determined entirely by the nobility with which it is done. And that applies to all things, whether it be tying your shoes, looking at the sky, or hoping for the master's approval. Announcing to yourself what you are doing also validates your choices in life. You have chosen to put on your shoes. You have chosen to spend a moment looking at the sky. You have chosen to hope for the master's approval. This is an affirmation on your own activity, your own freedom and agency in a vastly complicated world. But all of these options, possibilities, and potential outcomes are fundamentally and realistically constantly reduced to singular choices. And these choices take the form of actions. So when you announce to yourself what you are doing, you are solidifying your role in the universe. One microsecond at a time. And this is the essence of mindfulness. Now for a short time, every few seconds, or if you prefer to go slower, every few moments, announce to yourself exactly what you're doing. Excellent. I can feel already that more of your mind is in the now, less of it lost in the past we cannot change, and the future which does not yet exist. This is good. Now you are ready for the third method in the first exercise. This is the road to mindfulness. Mindfulness is being here now, doing this now. The third method is no longer active. You have naming things you see and announcing your actions as the first two methods. They are active. The third is passive. Passive mindfulness is the most difficult. As a matter of fact, it's nearly impossible. But do not lose heart. It's the trying that matters, not the outcome. It's the doing that is the joy in life not the having. And when it comes to mindfulness, your road is the treasure, not the destination. And passive mindfulness is the simple ability to pay attention. Now again, this may seem so reductive of consciousness that it's bordering on useless, but if you truly hear my words and give it a try, you will realize how truly challenging it can be to pay attention attention. How often do we find ourselves lost in thought? And even the very phrase lost in thought implies that we are navigating poorly, <laughs> that we are not taking the road to our destination, that we are wandering. 
To be lost in thought is to be the opposite of in the moment. You are thinking about things that are not happening to you at the present moment, but passive mindfulness is the ability to pay attention to what is happening without using 90% of your mind to judge it, plan for more of it, want more of it, want less of it, desire to change it, to push it or hasten it, or to wish it would go slower. All of these responses that we have to things that happen to us, the things that we experience, are perfectly normal. You don't need to shove them down. Your task with passive mindfulness is to simply let it be and not to use your mind power on these reactions, but to use your mind power on paying attention. A perfect example is to look around your surroundings right now. Find a color that appeals to you. It could be any object, a person, the sky, anything. Find a color and pay attention to this color. Colors are a wonderful center point for mindfulness because often they ask very little of us and offer much. They offer mood and luster and tone. They even imply era. They even imply quality. Sometimes they remind us of good times and sometimes we're nostalgic in a sad way about a color. All of these responses are fine. Your task, your method, your exercise to mindfulness is to merely pay attention to the effects that this color has upon you. Or, even more difficult, to pay attention to the color in and of itself. To spend the time it takes to let that color be in your attention. Like the other methods, you will quickly become bored with this color. It will seem silent and abstract and useless to you. You see a million colors. Why fixate on the one? This boredom is the feeling of growth in your mindfulness exercise. And the more skilled you become in your mindfulness, the longer you will be able to postpone this boredom. And the more in the moment you will be for longer periods, you will find yourself more rested, you will find yourself happier, more fulfilled, more prepared for the infinite challenges that will continue to come your way. The pain and the suffering, the anxiety will not stop, but you will find yourself more well-equipped to deal with what is actually happening, not with what you dread may happen or wish had not occurred. Take time now to pay attention to this color. Excellent. Excellent. I see already in you that mindfulness is not so far away at all. But your experience of it, even in a minute way, will vastly open your consciousness. Let it open. Don't be afraid to apply new ways of thinking or to write them off, to forget them, or to consider them trite, silly, or fantasy. Make no mistake, these are some of the oldest techniques known to man to become more intelligent, more aware, more creative, more available, more vivid. And you can benefit from them as much as the countless minds that have in the thousands of years that these practices have been developed. So take shelter in the simple and continue to practice the first exercise, mindfulness. Good.
Good. I see that your mindfulness is already growing, that you've taken the lessons to heart. This is no easy thing to do, but you must. Now, come closer, and I will tell you of the second technique. This is called no mind, and it is nearly impossible. There have been many names for the art of no mind. Imagine a world where the mind was not thoughts. This also has many names, but for our purpose we will call it the witness. Now close your eyes. Let whatever thoughts may pass through your mind, your schedule, your comfort level, your clothing, listening to this transmission, anything. These are all thoughts. You are not those thoughts. You are witnessing those thoughts. You are seeing them rise and fall, come and go. Feel this separation. You from the thoughts. The thoughts are rising out of different parts of your perception, different parts of your senses, and different parts of your consciousness. The thoughts may involve the present, the past, or the future. They may be positive or negative thoughts, but you are only witnessing the existence of these thoughts, the rising, the falling, and the disappearance of these thoughts. You are separate. You only witness them. This can be a very difficult concept in the beginning. Now take some time. Let yourself think whatever you choose. You are still the actor in this scene, but you are not the dialogue. You are watching the thoughts rise and fall, come and go. They may come from some part of you, but you are so much more than merely thoughts. Let yourself become that more. Be the witness to your thoughts, not the thoughts themselves. Take a brief moment to experiment with this technique. Be the witness to your thoughts, whatever they may be. Anyone who tries this method in earnest will immediately notice something happening. The thoughts are so enticing, so all-encompassing, so seductive, so sticky. They lead us down rabbit holes of thought. We cling to them. We become emotionally involved in them. We see importance, and many of them seem more important than the art of practicing the witness. You very quickly become distracted, antsy, agitated. You want to open your eyes. You're done with this. Don't be discouraged. This is the response of everyone who attempts the art of no mind and you will never be completely free of it. Our attachment and involvement in our thoughts is one of the most fundamental features of our consciousness. So to truly become the witness is terribly difficult. But there are methods to get you through it. Now take a breath, rest a bit, Close your eyes again. Once again, see yourself as the witness, not as the thoughts themselves. You are not simply an aggregate of thoughts that are rising and falling. You are a consciousness beyond those thoughts. Now some will come and go effortlessly, like dandelion seeds on the breeze, but others have a great deal of importance, or dread, 
or emotion or nostalgia or even positivity or craving. When a thought finds itself sticking to you, pulling on you to stay involved with it, to stay focused on it, thinking about it, all you need is a log. Up in your mind, conjure a log. It's a few feet long, maybe a hand in thickness, a recently cut firewood log, perhaps. Now take this log, and upon it, place this thought, this one that seems so sticky, this one that you know needs your attention. Place this thought on your log, and with your mind's eye, place this log down into the invisible river of all your thoughts, all your consciousness, this endless stream that can be so distracting, so involving to us, and simply let it flow downstream. There it goes, diminishing now with distance, with the thought riding on its back like carpenter ants heading to the waterfall. It isn't gone forever. You haven't solved the mystery of the universe. You are merely using a visualization to remind yourself the fundamental truth. You are not the thoughts. You are the one who places the log in the river. There are many methods to train the mind to release thoughts. And there are many ways that this practice has been described or named in the past. And you may be familiar with some of those names. You may have heard discussions of attachment, how attachment actually causes suffering in us. We become attached to our emotions and our thoughts in such a way that when we want to change, which is inevitable, these thoughts are like baggage. They're like possessions and attachment pins you down, keeps you from changing, and reduces your freedom. But you are different. You are here in the sanctum. You are in my chamber to learn about no mind. And at the highest level, you will become the witness. And something very strange happens. And it may be for a microsecond. Even the true masters of this art form get very short amounts of time where they achieve anything like this state. What you will find is that the witness seems to have no mind at all. The witness is a formless and pure being, and that's you. The idea of a mind is not the same as the idea of consciousness. You are a free, changing, plastic, luminescent, buoyant thing. The mind and the thoughts are merely shadows moving in front of you. I want you to take a great deal of time and begin to develop the skill of no mind. A daily practice of five minutes is plenty. You will find five minutes to be an eternity when practicing the art of letting go of your thoughts, letting them pass you by. They still can occur. They will occur. We are thinking beings, but we are not the thoughts that we think. They are just leaves floating down the river.
enter. Sit. The master has informed me that you are ready for the third exercise. That you have begun your training in the art of mindfulness and the art of no mind. Perhaps we shall see. The final exercise can be very challenging, but far easier to comprehend than no mind, which is a riddle to us all. The final exercise is the art of visualizing the body, visualizing the breath. Now this can be an easy thing at the entry level, but a powerful and challenging skill at the higher. Do as I ask. Focus your attention on my words and set aside distractions. If you have become skilled at the other two exercises, as I've been told, this should be easy. With your eyes closed, bring your attention to your breath. Breathe any way you choose. Simply feel the air moving in, and feel the air exiting. The more aware you become of the breath, you begin to sense its deeper properties. Not only in the edges of the nostrils, or on the tender lips, but in the throat, in the upper chest, behind the ribs, deep in the lungs, or all the way down to the diaphragm in the gut. We are full and we are empty, countless times each day. But you are pay attention, paying attention to every detail of this process. And the more details you can glean from each inhale and each exhale, the more skilled you will become at visualizing the body, visualizing the breath, and you can create positive effects with this skill. The simplest of these exercises is to continue your focus on the breath. And with each rhythm, to see the breath. See it as white light, drawn in almost as smoke, exhaled almost like gray water or weightless incense, drawn in again and released, glowing brighter than dimmer, liquid of vapor, When this visualization becomes to crystallize, begins to crystallize in your mind's eye, begin to condense this visualization with each inhale. Bring in the white light of air into your body, into the core of your body. Fill your lungs, every inch of them. And when they're full, compress all of that white light into a smaller mass and then release it once again and again and again. When you feel you are able to perform this most minimal form of breath visualization, you may begin to move the compressed mass of light. With your next inhale, Bring in all of that glowing air, that gleaming smoke, 
the white water glowing inside you as you draw it in, compress it into a smaller mass, and begin to move it slightly upward, more toward your heart. Then release it again. Repeat. With each breath you will gain skill. And here is the secret. Wherever that white sphere of pure breath energy goes, the body will have more energy, will become focused, will be flush with fresh oxygenated blood. Your mind has the ability to extraordinarily nourish specific parts of the body with concentration. The glowing of the air, the focus on the breath, has no magical properties in and of itself. It is merely a mechanism for you to focus your attention on a specific part of the body and bring your consciousness to that location. To bring the very animate force that is in you to a specific part of your body. The more skilled you become, the more you can accelerate healing, the more you can accelerate creativity, the more you can let go of pain, the more you can pull your posture upright, the more you can let your mind itself, your brain in fact, be nourished. At first, this may sound like hokum or magic or silliness. But it is the, sir, the third exercise. I am not here to coddle you. You have mastered or at least begun the art of mindfulness, the art of no mind, which no one can master. And this is a far more practical art, but requires the full attention of the brain, the mind, the thoughts, the witness, all of it, to harness this power. And that is why it is kept here in the third chamber. Now take a moment. Practice this art. Draw the breath in. Visualize it. Condense it. And experiment with subtle movements. Excellent. I see the color returning to your cheeks, the light in your eyes sparkling brighter than a moment ago. Enjoy this. There is more to the road than mastery itself. Enjoy each step. Reward yourself for the practice itself, not some desired outcome. There will be outcomes, but none more precious than the doing of a thing. None more immediate than now. I can teach you no more. Master? Master, I've, I've performed the three lessons as you described. It's been 12 years, Master. I finally return to visit you and all I find is this stone marker here in the snow. The snow is drifting on the boulders, the lichen frozen solid. Only a few pines are even poking up through the drifts. It's so deep this year. Your little marker has a tiny sprig of holly next to it. A splash of red in this blue and white mountain. 